to our next panel, uh, A Road Paved with Good Intentions, uh, examining uh, the role of the CPA from the drafter's perspective. Uh, we've had a great uh, kind of big picture from General Simbewo. I think we're going to move now um, to a number of people that worked intensively uh, with General Simbewo uh, during that period, um, get into some of the granularity uh, of what went into this process. As the general outlined, there were choices made uh, at, the, at the time of the CPA, what to include, what not to include, what had to be agreed upon, what could be left or had to be left uh, for, for future agreement. Um, uh, so this was very much um, a negotiation process uh, uh, in, in that um, many things uh, that I'm sure the mediators wanted settled uh, was, was not ultimately settled. Uh, we're going to talk, I think uh, we'll, we'll begin with the panel here um, to talk a little bit about the choices that were made, the things that were kind of postponed, and perhaps then the consequences that, uh, that have grown out of uh, the decisions that were made in that process. Uh, we're going to begin with Nicholas Hasten. You all have extensive biographies um, in your, uh, along with your agenda. Uh, he's from, he is Director for Political Affairs in the Executive Office of Ban Ki-moon. Uh, as you'll see from his bio, uh, constitutional work in South Africa, in Iraq, but in a, in a whole slew of, of countries, uh, conflicted countries across the world. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, Nicholas Hasem with us here today. We have Susan Page, who is currently uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for African Affairs at the U.S. State Department. Uh, she's covering Central and Southern Africa. She's a Harvard-trained lawyer with a long history um, of experience uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, she was, uh, again, a resource person within the EGAD mediating team, <coughs> uh, uh, and, and since then was uh, uh, with the National Democratic Institute uh, uh, on uh, uh, working on uh, East Africa, I think, East and Southern Africa again. Again, uh, you have the bios, a long history working on, on again, very difficult issues. And then we have Julius, uh, Julian uh, Hottinger, who is an expert in mediation and facilitation in the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs expert pool. Uh, he was senior research federal uh, fellow at the Institute of Federalism. Uh, he has worked uh, in, this, in, in his capacity um, on, on, again, a whole range of difficult, seemingly intractable processes uh, on, in Somalia, work, done work on the LRA, uh, on Sudan, um, and uh, the, the, the list goes on. We're going to turn, uh, so with that kind of, that wasn't a very uh, uh, great introduction, but why don't we turn to our panelists. <laughs> I will begin with you, Nicholas, and move through the panel and open up for questions. We'll try to end at 11.15 so that the second panel has a kind of equivalent time. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. I thought I would start by just reflecting uh, on the CPA, the nature of the CPA, and what we as a mediation team did or tried to do. The way I think of mediation teams is that they, they find parties who are hostages to their own imagination, their own experience, their own relationships, and what we try and do as mediators is to broaden that imagination to give them the tools to rethink and perhaps talk to each other in different ways uh, with new things. So in that task, and that is really as much as we can do, is to broaden their imagination. The agreement remains that of the parties. And it's quite important to bear in mind that the parties, the form of their agreement is represented in the black and white of the text. I, I say that because uh, since the CPA was signed, obviously a lot of people have approached us and questioned us on its uh, shortcomings, principally in three areas, either in regard to the process, secondly in regard to the ambiguities in the text itself, or thirdly in regard to gaps, what is not in the agreement. And I just want to touch on uh, those three conceptually, and Julian and Susan will pick up some of those issues. On the process, perhaps the, um, the most uh, enduring critique is the uh, narrow base of the agreement itself. In other words, it was between two belligerents, and it dealt with matters which necessarily involved a wide range of actors and players in Sudan who were not in the process. 
And I think there are good reasons for expressing that anxiety because good agreements have all the spoilers or potential spoilers uh, in uh, from the start and they sign off on the agreement. And it needs to be said, or but it needs to be said, typically ceasefire agreements start off with the belligerents and the belligerents only. You don't want other players at the table. And that is really how this agreement started off. And as it expanded to deal with more general and constitutional questions in Sudan, it behoved us as the mediation to point out to the parties that it was dealing with matters which required other players at the table, even if only the other militia groups in the south or the opposition in the north. Um, and it really was very decidedly, <coughs> despite uh, the, the repetitively raising the issue, uh, the decision of the parties that this agreement could only be effectively reached if they were the two players and that they would stand responsible for bringing the other parties in. So that was a choice, uh, a choice uh, of the parties themselves. Uh, in regard, uh, no, then let me just mention one other thing. The other aspect of inclusivity which we raised repetitively was the absence of women at the negotiating table. And that also was the choice of the parties to make it a uh, largely uh, and almost always an all-male event. The second issue is uh, ambiguities, and perhaps just to explain why these texts typically have ambiguities. We like to think of them as creative ambiguities, but they can be also disastrous ambiguities. Uh, that is because the enormous pressure to find agreement and to find agreement on some of the core issues which divide the parties. And frequently, uh, that issue is not ripe for resolution there and then. Uh, and the parties know that they cannot definitively and in detail resolve it. But they have to keep the agreement going. They have to stop a breakdown in the talks. And, 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 and peace talks typically are like riding a bicycle. If you stand still, you will fall over, and then you will go backwards, in fact. And, and you've got to pick up the pieces later. And so generally with ambiguities, what you do is you find a formula that both parties can live with, and they sign on to it knowing that the other party has a different idea of what, that, uh, what is meant by that phrase. But with some resolve, we usually hope that in the course of uh, time and the implementation of the agreement, the collaboration that necessarily must exist between the parties, they will find a way to work out that problem. I mean, I think... One of those examples would be the issue of the description uh, in, in the two disputed northern areas that uh, uh, the uh, government will undertake a popular consultation. <coughs> we don't know what a popular consultation is, and I know that people have approached me to say, what did you mean by popular consultation? What we can tell you is the parties agreed that it wouldn't be a referendum, or that they wouldn't put the word referendum in, although it didn't preclude uh, a referendum in... Uh, southern Blue Nile and in uh, Southern Kordofan, in Blue Nile State and Southern Kordofan. Um, and so that, uh, that is really uh, uh, um, uh, what we hope for as mediators when we have these uh, ambig ambiguous provisions. And it needs to be said, we can't legislate political will. We can ask in situations where the process is not inclusive that they inscribe in the agreement, even when they have decided to keep other parties out, they inscribe in the agreement processes which will bring other parties in later on in the implementation of the accord. And that was really the best we could do in regard to the inclusivity. In regard to ambiguities, it's our duty to advise the parties. You've got different views on this and it's going to play out badly. Or to provide, or and to provide mechanisms in the agreement to allow the parties in the course of implementing the agreement to, to, to uh, deal with the ambiguities and gaps. Finally, just on the question of gaps, uh, uh, Julian and Susan will talk about the very important part of every agreement, which is the implementation, generally how reluctant parties are at the end of the deal to start to deal with the messy details of who's going to do what and where and with what money. Um, but the one issue which is of particular importance is the question of the morning after uh, the referendum. Um, it is perhaps the most uh, volatile moment uh, that we will find in Sudanese history, if I can be speculative. Um, and the truth is, and we pointed this out to the parties, a referendum in many senses is an opinion poll. 
It is not a legal act of secession. Referendums, if the South decides to secede, require a number of events consequent upon that decision. They require to resolve questions like assets, national debt, share of it, uh, the sharing of the oil, and all the other arrangements under which they are and their futures are kind of deeply entwined at the moment. The truth is that the parties were uh, unwilling at that point to negotiate the post-referendum consequences, and uh, perhaps understandably, because the mere fact that they had agreed to this process, relatively unique in Africa, which is a consensual division, as it were, a consensual divorce, just in re response to a previous question, I think African leaders set their face against unilateral declarations of independence. But where it's a consensual process, there's no, uh, and shouldn't be any, any opposition. And the CPA essentially delivers a consensual process uh, in theory. Um, so it's just to, to sort of really emphasize that uh, in regard to the referendum, there are a number of issues which have to be organized. Uh, last week uh, at, in the New York uh, mini-summit, the parties were quite clear in agreeing to the referendum to hold it timelessly and peacefully, to abide by its results, give effect to its decision, uh, and to plan for the consequences publicly. Privately, quite frankly, the old bitterness and, and, and low levels of trust emerged uh, in the discussions. And I think that's just the last point I'd make about uh, the CPA. No agreement can legislate uh, political will, can prescribe a spirit of partnership. Uh, at best, what we can hope for is that the mechanics of implementing the agreement sees the parties actively assume a kind of co-management and a joint responsibility and uh, some ownership and, and collaborative uh, spirit which comes out of that co-ownership. But if they don't uh, exhibit that, then really th it's not to the agreement that one can go to find it. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, Susan. Thank you very much. It's always difficult to go after uh, General Simbewo and, uh, and Fink, as we call him, and uh, know him lovingly. Um, but I'll, I'll try to do my best. I think the issues were really quite well framed, both by Steve Morrison in the introduction, by the ambassador, Swiss ambassador, and, and Jennifer, and then given the overall view from General Simbewo. But I think what I'll try to do is um, be a little bit more specific on the areas that, um, that Fink mentioned. In terms of inclusivity, um, we actually had lots of debates about the word inclusivity, which does not really appear in the, in the dictionary. See, I'm even saying the Bible. Um, <laughs> and, um, but one of the ways that we tried to deal with it was to help the parties to get beyond the, the um, the sole uh, responsibility of the parties by both the SPLM and, and the NCP um, in two ways, well, in, in several ways, but one was that both sides claimed that they represented their constituents, the rest of the population. So in the case of the NCP, the rest of the North, um, and in the case of the SPLM, the rest of the South or the entire South. Um, one of the things that came out of the peace agreement was to try to broaden that support, but also to figure out what level of support they really had from the population. So one thing that General Simbewo did was to organize a trip throughout the country, um, not just the South, but also to the North, um, and try to find out what people were saying. Of course, you're always going to get some rallies that are going to be exclusively driven by um, one side or the other to get as many of their supporters there. But it was to try to get a sense of what other people were thinking and whether there was, in fact, some popular support for the positions that were being taken or argued for. Um, another area was to try to um, encourage civil society. And this has been another one of the uh, complaints in terms of inclusivity, not just the lack of women participation at the negotiating table, which we didn't really have any control over, but also the fact that civil society was not engaged in any um, sort of at role at the table. And so what we tried to do was to make sure that we constantly briefed civil society, that we had regular meetings with civil society, so that they were at least heard and that their views were in some sense incorporated 
even if it was just through us listening and being able to try to incorporate some of those conclusions into the actual peace agreement. The last thing I would mention on the, um, on the inclusivity bit is um, when it got down to the final, uh, the final terms of some of the commissions that were established, and this actually goes to a bit of the ambiguity point, which I'll speak about in a second, was to um, encourage the parties to have this National Constitutional Review Commission. And to the party's credit, that was actually a very inclusive body, and that was meant to get civil society, uh, opposition from both the North and the South, uh, labor leaders and, and others to help with the drafting of those new laws that had to come into being. So I think that was one of the successful uh, portions of, in fact, trying to overcome that burden. And the parties took it upon themselves to um, broaden that network that we had established as a 60-member committee. And initially, they decided to actually make it up to 180 people. So you know, you can imagine that an unwieldy group is, is hard to manage, but at the same time, they wanted to encourage a broader group, at least for the Constitution, the new Constitution, to be drafted. So I think that was a positive step. Um, in terms of ambiguity, I, I would mention a couple of things. One of them is that what we tried to do was to actually study the Addis Ababa Agreement and look at where there were shortcomings and to try to overcome some of those. Of course, all agreements have their own context and you can't overcome everything. But one of the areas that we tried to make a difference in was by encouraging the parties to come up with this notion of the presidency. And this has been both a success and in some ways a failure because um, while we tried to encourage the collegial presidency and it's, it's actually very specifically uh, uh, listed um, in the, uh, it says, um, you know, there shall be established the institution of the presidency consisting of the president and two vice presidents. Uh, what we did was to spell out the specific uh, responsibilities and functions of the two vice presidents. And we said there shall be a par partnership and collegial decision making process within the institution of the presidency in order to safeguard the peace agreement. Now, while we said this and the parties, this is what the parties agreed to. As Fink said, we have to remember this is the agreement that the parties <coughs> created. We helped them with language, with suggestions, but ultimately this is what they decided upon. Now, where I think there have been some real misgivings in terms of the uh, implementation has been that a lot of the ambiguity rested with decisions couldn't be made. We bump it up, the parties agreed, they would bump it up to the presidency because this was to be the collegial entity that would resolve all of the problems. And so um, that has been an area where I think the ambiguity um, has not often been resolved at the presidential level. And one of those examples, of course, is ABA, where the parties had two very different uh, views of the ABA um, Boundary Commission report, and yet the presidency really couldn't make that decision. And so ultimately, it had to be solved through another political mechanism, which was the arbitration uh, and the arbitration court. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, reconciliation. One of the things that we had put together, I mean, if you actually look at the Machacos Protocol, the Machacos Protocol is a broad framework for what we hope to include into the ultimate, what became ultimately the CPA but it's an outline of the things that should be incorporated, a final ceasefire, uh, some sort of power sharing arrangement, some sort of resource sharing, uh, separation of the militaries, et cetera. And one of the things that, that uh, came out of that was we tried to encourage the parties to have some sort of a truth and reconciliation commission of sorts you can call it whatever you like, but some sort of truth telling that would get to reconciliation of really these very hardened positions um, and animosity between two groups that had been fighting for a long time. Um, and ultimately, the best that the parties could do was to come up with a process. And so as Fink said, a lot of the agreement is helping them find a way to get to a process 
that can ultimately resolve some of these issues. Um, unfortunately, it's one of the areas that the parties really didn't do very much with, even though um, it's very clearly in the agreement that a process of reconciliation would be instituted by the parties, um, the details of which would be worked out. Um, and it just never really got worked out. So that, I think, is, is, uh, is quite a pity. Um, and I think I will, the only other thing I would like to add is we've talked a lot about the referenda, the referendum for Southern Sudan, for the people of Southern Sudan, and the referenda, referendum in Abye. And um, one of the areas that is frequently not mentioned is the fact that the day after the vote takes place, since they're both supposed to occur on the same day, there's still six more months left in the CPA period. And that leads right into, I think, what Julian's going to talk about in terms of the implementation modalities and that period of arranging what kind of post-referenda period they will have. Um, on what kind of basis will the CPA be the basis? Will they create some new model? Um, whether it's unity or secession, will there be um, some of the clauses of the CPA, will they continue in the north? Will they continue in the south? Um, you do have two, uh, two constitutions, and each state has its own constitution as well. They're interim until they, the referenda uh, are, occur, but that hasn't been discussed much, although we talk a lot about the other modalities that have to be worked out. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning. I must say it's a pleasure to be here five years and a half later and thinking about what we did then. And it's especially a pleasure to see General Sembeyo think and Susan again. We had, our paths have crossed off and on. But it's the first time that we're sitting down and probably looking back at the CPA and thinking about what we did do then and how we did do it. I must also admit that um, we discussed what we were going to talk about last night and I went home and went to bed and woke up all of a sudden at about four in the morning and my goodness, all of it came back like a flash, all of a sudden. <laughs> remember the best moments, remember the worst moments? And to tell the truth, still wondering what we did do right, what we did do wrong, and to what extent we could have done better. And it's probably a weight that a mediator carries to the end of his days. Is this notion of, we did something, we thought it was the best then, is it still the best five years later on? Well, we can question it. And to a certain extent, I think we have to stick with the idea that we did at that moment what we were thought was correct, the best, and at the same time with the parties, or to a certain extent for the parties, hoping that it would help them. What I'm basically going to mention in a few minutes, and I do have a lot to say, I must admit, is probably talk about the implementation, because it is the element right now that influences the next steps. <laughs> We got the peace agreement, it was signed. To tell the truth, we had the peace agreement already back on the 26th of May 2004, and on purpose, we prolongated the process for a while. What we did on purpose to a certain extent was say, we don't want to repeat the mistakes that had been done in Addis, with the Addis Agreement. And what we want to do is we want to consolidate that implementation. And we took another six months negotiating the implementation. And a lot of people were surprised. They were saying, but my goodness, you, you've got the protocols. Well, what's the use in negotiating this implementation? Let's get the protocol signed, and then we'll see what we do next. And we were conscious that the parties were still marked, or if you prefer, traumatized by the Addis experience. And the fact that there had been no implementation in that agreement, they were convinced that if there wasn't an implementation in this one, the potential risk was that it all end up like the Addis agreement did. <coughs> so we took more time. We negotiated those implementation scales. And if you look at the agreement out of the 241 pages of the agreement, a good 30% are implementation skills. And they weren't easy to negotiate. They weren't easy to negotiate for the very simple reason that the parties had chosen a technique of negotiation, which is to negotiate protocols. And once they had negotiated a protocol, for example, the wealth sharing protocol, they sealed it with their signatures. And they were not keen on reopening it. So of course, what we had by the end of the negotiations were a series of protocols that had been negotiated in sequence. There had not been much trading off in between the protocols, not to say very little. And once we had to go look at the implementation, 
we found ourselves pinned down with the details. What were the details exactly? How had they been understood by each party? To what extent did they understand the same thing? To what extent could they agree on what they had understood? And to what extent could we keep them focused and trying to figure out how to do the implementation without necessarily starting to unravel everything? And it was a hard time. It was a hard time also because techniques change. When you negotiate implementation, you don't negotiate it the same way you negotiate the rest of the agreement. And you've got to bring more people on board. You've got to work on it differently. You've got to get the parties to stay focused on what is the implementation. And at the same time, not find yourself caught in a game where there's a tendency of saying, let the other side implement, and then we'll see what we implement. And always, to a certain extent, saying we're not responsible for what's being done and let someone else be held responsible. But I think the negotiations on the implementation did bring about one positive aspect. And this was an aspect in which the parties really took possession of the document. They probably <laughs> possessed it about 70, 75, or 80 percent. But after the implementation, it was their document. And to a certain extent, after having looked through it, worked on it, and drawn the implementation models, they had the feeling that they possessed it and it did belong to them. And they were conscious that there was still a lot of work to be done. <coughs> Within the implementation, the difficult element were the protocols. We had content beyond what you can imagine. In peace processes, what, happen quite, what happens quite often is when you discuss and you negotiate, you can still dream. You can imagine things. But then when it comes to looking at the implementation, you've got to concretely say what is going to be done, what can be done, and how can it be done. And it's a sense of reality that's brought back on board. And to a certain moment or a certain, in certain occasions, for the parties, it's a shock. It's a way of saying, well, now we have to concretely look at what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. And I think the implementation in that sense probably was a shock for the parties. But above all, what we had difficulties in handling when we look back retrospectively was the mass of information, just the quantity of information we had, the richness of the protocols, and to a certain extent, how do you sequence them in such a way that there's some form of logic. And what we were obliged to do was to establish an implementation matrix, an implementation matrix that had to look at each protocol individually. What had to be done in the Machakos protocol, the first one signed in July 2002? What had to be done within the security arrangements, which was not a complete protocol that had been signed in September 2003? What had to be done in between with, sorry, or within the weather, the wealth sharing, excuse me, protocol that was signed in January 2004? And finally, the three conflict areas, ABA, Kordofan, and the Southern Blue Nile, not to mention the power sharing protocol that was signed in May 2004. All of this had to be combed through, looked into, to a certain extent analyzed, and shared out. What we did find ourselves with was, as Fink mentioned, a lot of creative ambiguity. We found ourselves also confronted with, to a certain extent, parties read their agreement differently. And to a certain extent, if we hadn't combed through this document, we probably would have had more problems with the implementation later on than we did already then when we were trying to establish the matrix. I also think the problem we came about was the problem that we had a lot of principles. A terrible lot of principles in the documents, but not always a clear way in which they had to be applied and what they should be applied for. One of the most difficult elements was when we were working on security issues was the joint integrated units. These units that are combined forces made up of the Sudan Armed Forces and the SPLA that were supposed to coordinate their activities and at the same time be responsible for certain sectors of security in certain defined areas. These joint integrated units, due to the difference of perception, have never worked. They've been put together. To tell the truth, they sit in camps, one next to the other, but they totally ignore each other. They sit back to back and just don't fulfill their mission as they should be fulfilling. If I mention this, it's to say to what point what we had to really do at a certain moment within this peace process, and it remains for me one of the hardest aspects, was we had to establish what I call a vision of society. We were obliged within Sudan not only to say things have to change. We can aspire to some federal model or some form of a democracy, but we also had to say things have to change fundamentally. And what we have to do is we have to establish a vision of Sudan where we're looking six years and a half down the road and we're saying we're going to try for unity, and if we can't manage for unity, we will have to accept that there might be separation, a separation that will take place through a referendum. 
And this was the hardest task of all, without doubt. Now, these are just running from one element to the other, going along quite quickly, to tell the truth. But I would like to insist on one last aspect before I give back the floor, and that is the aspect of saying we mustn't forget the CPA had a precise mission. The CPA's mission was to say it's to stop the war. The CPA's mission was to say we know what we will do in the next six years and a half, and then it's for the Sudanese to decide what they think will be best. This option today is heading towards its final stage. We've had six months of an interim period at the beginning, what was to prepare for the six years of transition. On the 9th of January, we'll be entering the last phase, which is another six months before the CPA should end. And for the moment, it's not clear what will happen. The Sudanese have put out a law, a law what they talk on the transition draft of, Somal of southern Sudan, and it's a referendum bill that they've established in 2009, in which they're very precise in saying they have to negotiate a series of key concepts. To tell the truth, there are 11. The first one being nationality, the second one being currency, the third one being public service, the fourth one, position of the liqui liquidated combined units, that is the famous joint integrated units I mentioned, <laughs> the national security and intelligence, the international conventions and agreements, the liabilities, the oil fields, its production and transport, contracts and environment in the oil fields, water, and finally, ownership. These topics, in principle, will have to be negotiated before the referendum takes place. We're talking about 92 days away. It most surely won't happen. And already some people are saying, well, we'll have to push it back later on and negotiate it once the referendum has taken place. These key elements, if we look at them, were the key elements that already figured within the peace agreement, the CBA. And the only thing we find ourselves is, at a certain moment, these issues coming back in the front and having to be looked at in different ways. Institutionally speaking, Sudan is supposed to be held, is supposed to be heading and building up a federal model. If it considered itself to have a federal model already back in 1920, or from, I'd say from 1989 on, the truth is it's not a complete federal model, and it's far from being an extensive federal model. The issue that will come about, constitutionally speaking, is will they look for a federal model or will they look for something else? And to tell the truth, we really don't know what to expect. I think sincerely, and this is just a, point, a personal point of view, that within the CPA, we did what we could do. We mustn't forget, as Fink said himself, it's not the drafters who own the document. The document doesn't belong to the drafters. At best, we can bring along some expertise, some help, and try to caress the parties in such a way that they can work on their issues and find what they think are their agreements. Our Sudanese friends found an agreement that has brought them up to where they are now, and with luck I hope that they will find an agreement that will bring them further on. But to think that this is the last step would be a mistake, and to think that this is the last step with a solution would also be a mistake. When I was working in Northern Ireland at a very initial stage in the talks about the talks, we were sent there to stop the violence already then, and one of the problems that came about was the problem of saying, will we, these people be able to agree amongst themselves or not agree amongst themselves? And we had got into a solution where we said, well, the aim is to stop the violence, and we'll probably have to wait a generation. That generation mark still is there for me. And quite often, I think peace processes bring about answers. They continue to have to be worked on. They bring more answers. And to a certain extent, you need to give time to time before you can say if it's a success or not a success. So that's where we probably stand today. I've talked my nine minutes, so I'll stop there. And uh, I probably just would end with a joke, what will kind of um, give a bit of a pragmatic insight about all of this. Poor Susan has heard it more than once, so I'm sorry about it. Uh, my son, oh, he's a young man now. He's quite a big boy. But when he was very small at school, they asked him what his parents used to do or did. And he said, my mother, well, she's a school teacher. He explained where she taught and what she taught. And as for my father... Well, he's got a strange job. He goes to these faraway countries where people fight, and he tells them not to fight. But, you know, no one listens to him. <laughs> so probably you shouldn't listen to me either. Thank you. Thanks very much to all of you.
um, let's open up for questions. I, I had a question perhaps about kind of the, the importance of personalities within the talks. We've talked about General Simbewo's role as mediator. Uh, John Garang obviously was a key uh, power within that, and then on the on the Khartoum side, but, but, but died uh, sh shortly after the CPA was signed, and on the Khartoum side, the lead negotiator perhaps uh, w didn't kind of hold the same position uh, following in the in the interim period. And I just wonder, uh, we, we could take a few at a time, but I wonder if you might reflect on the role of key personalities and divisions within Khartoum and within the SPLM perhaps uh, following the, the CPA and during uh, the negotiation of the CPA. Um, let's open, though, for some questions. We have one there. I'll get my glasses back on. Hello, and thank you. My name is Vicki Economides. I'm with PILPG. Um, so you all discussed both the idealistic and the pragmatic, and my question is, if the North does not or refuses to recognize the outcome of the referendum, um, how will the international community respond? Will there be more mediation or will they attempt to enforce the results? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Richard Sawoya with the National Foreign Trade Council. Perhaps this is addressed to uh, Secretary Page. Uh, could you comment on the role of uh, the U.S. sanctions as we approach this referendum. Okay, uh, uh, we're going to go over here next. The gentleman here, and then the. Uh, yes, my name is Mark Esquino. Uh, I'm with the Department of State, um, and until quite recently, Deputy Chief of Mission at uh, the U.S. Embassy in Khartoum. Um, my question really is on the role of the United Nations, um, both in terms of what they have done up to date on MIS uh, in mi mitigation between the North and, and the South, but also to, to, to the panel uh, on what role they see during the referendum. Um, I was in Khartoum during uh, the April elections. Uh, despite criticism, I think the UN really had an admirable role um, in uh, providing support for those elections. And then finally, in the post-referendum period, what what is reasonable to expect from UNMISS in terms of peacekeeping and other functions? Thank you. Um, finally, the TCM, and then keep in mind, we'll, the second panel is also going to be looking a little bit forward, so th there's going to be some overlap between these Thank two you panels. Again. So, yes, sir. I would like first to, uh, my name is Fathar Rahman Ali from Embassy of Sudan. Uh, this is the time to, to say thank you, uh, Switzerland and CSIS, and uh, General Assembly today with us, with uh, one of the great uh, people in the CPA history and uh, the group of drafters and mediator who are here with us today. Uh, in this uh, moment, I would like to ask what the, the role should be by the international community in this turning point. We are heading to the uh, referendum and many pressure were uh, deployed on our country especially when mentioning the sanctions and the environment uh, the the country is uh, moving towards this uh, referendum where there is a sanctions there's pressures and uh, the country needs support in both now in the political uh, side and on the development both in the south and the north and how the international community would uh, would give the support in the development in the process and uh, to pave the way for uh, this critical moment in the history. And I would like again to to give our tribute to Yana Sampoyo for this uh, uh, continuous support and the spirit to 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 give the, the people of Sudan again uh, uh, a new moment for the for the the coming uh, the coming critical time for the referendum and his uh, mediation is still going on with his spirit. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fatah. 
Let's uh, turn to the panel before we are lifted. going to answer two questions. The question about Garang, I think, is an important one. Oh, sorry. sorry. The question about um, John Garang uh, is important, and also the, uh, some might say, many commentators pointed out that Taha's prestige diminished uh, in power in Khartoum for a while in any event. And I think that alludes to the danger of writing the Constitution or writing, a, sorry, a peace agreement with personalities in mind. Um, and I th think Susan was correct in saying quite a few things in the Constitution, outstanding uh, issues or potentially uh, 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 issues which could derail the process were referred to the Presidential Council, very specifically with the view that John Garang uh, and Taha would be the ones dealing with it. And so that's just uh, a, a really a warning. Let me just deal secondly with the UN question. Uh, you know, when we started drafting the uh, agreement, and it's, you can see it in the Machakos Protocol, it was considered that the Evaluation and Assessment Committee would play a driving role in chiving the parties up to implement uh, the agreement. But by the time we signed off on the agreement, both parties had lost interest uh, in an institution outside their control or not owned by them. Uh, um, looking to the proper implementation of the agreement, and as a result, it became uh, rather marginal. Uh, the UN certainly didn't have that role to chivy up implementation. Um, and I th think for some time, really went through the motions of performing its role as agreed after the CPA. CPA is not very full on what the UN's role uh, should be. But I, I have no doubt that they've thrown their weight fully into organizing the referendum. They're, are really essentially involved in two processes. The one, which is to help the Sudanese physically administer the elections, to get ballot boxes and ballots out. Uh, secondly, to provide security. And there were certain aspects of the last elections and what transpired there in the South particularly, which are worrying, and which is certainly an indication uh, that uh, we would have to ensure, that UNMAS will have to ensure as far as it can uh, to provide the necessary security and stability in the region. Thirdly, the Secretary General has just appointed a high-level panel headed by uh, President Mkapa. It's a three-person panel, and its intention is to be quite separate from the administration of the elections, but to be a panel which can perform two functions, both which both parties recognized and, in fact, requested the UN to establish a mechanism to perform. And that was firstly to chivy the parties to behave properly during the election, recognizing that they have limited purchase on each other. Uh, if the North tells the South what to do, it's not necessarily the South will jump and, 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 and vice versa. So to have a high-level panel which can talk directly to the parties, and secondly, to ensure that the election, as far as possible, through their monitoring role, is free of intimidation and can be certified as such. And I know the Northerners in particular have a concern that if there is rampant intimidation in the South, uh, Northerners will challenge uh, the results and may well, uh, could well feel that they can't respect the result. So everybody has an interest in an intimidation-free and a violence-free election both in the North and in the South uh, if only for the purposes of that certification. Thanks. Susan. Okay. Um, let me just, let me first answer the question about um, how will the international community respond uh, based on the outcome. Um, I, I think that this is where it's really important to remember that this is actually a Sudanese agreement that was brokered, supported by whatever you want to call it, by EGAD, um, which had support from the rest of the international community. Um, as General Simbewo mentioned, there are a number of, uh, of countries and, and institutions that signed up as witnesses. Um, Julian and I have our copies of the CPA here with us. Um, you can see the difference. Julian's looks very pristine and mine is all battered. Um, I don't know what that says, but 
But um, there were a number of countries, um, uh, obviously the Sudanese, and then uh, Kenya, Uganda, uh, Egypt, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, uh, UK, US, African Union, European Union, uh, Norway twice in a different way, and Italy twice as the co-chairs of the uh, International EGAD Partners Forum, uh, Secretary General of the Arab League, uh, and uh, the UN. So these are all the countries that signed up as witnesses. Truth be told, we actually had to send the language out uh, and make sure that people could, that countries could sign up to it um, as witnesses and not as guarantors because they didn't want to have to enforce something that perhaps they weren't ready to take on. That said, um, I think that, as has been uh, spoken about already, the fact that the UN held this high-level meeting uh, last month in New York on the margins of the UN at the presidential level. I mean, President Obama made a very directed speech where he said what, at least how our administration feels, that it is absolutely essential that the referenda are held on time and that they respect the will of the Sudanese voters. Um, as Julian read out, they still haven't determined citizenship issues, who's going to vote uh, in uh, either of the referenda. So these are things that are, are still really challenging. Um, we've already discussed some of the African Union countries, but the whole idea was really to get the international community behind something that they already have signed up to help the parties get to. And um, while it may be a tricky subject and a touchy subject to, to talk about a possible civil divorce or whatever we want to call it, this was made specifically uh, in the CPA with the focus being on unity and the emphasis being on unity. Um, but if that can't work, they have this other alternative. So I think um, the international community, is, as General Simbewo mentioned, is kind of waking up a little bit belatedly. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I think that they will support at least following through with, uh, with helping the Sudanese get through to the end of, of the CPA obligations. Um, before I comment on sanctions, because I think uh, it's probably actually better for uh, the second panel, which um, will have Congress as well as uh, congressional representatives, as well as um, Tim Shortley, the Deputy Special Envoy uh, to General Gratian. Um, but let me just mention, I think also, in terms of the personalities, I think it was really quite critical. And although I, I do believe it's problematic to make things based too much on personalities, I also don't think we would be where we are if we had not had the courageous leadership of both uh, Vice President Taha and John Garang. And um, I don't think either of those can be underestimated. What uh, Kenya did was to take an extreme risk in inviting Vice President Taha and, uh, and uh, Dr. John Garang to Naivasha. We had a secret location that even we didn't know about. Um, and um, John Garang had, had stood up Vice President Taha before, so there was no guarantee that he was actually going to show up. And Vice President Taha waited for several days before we finally did manage to convince, uh, I mean, we all collectively, uh, four days before, uh, before um, Dr. John Grang showed up in Naivasha. And, um, but they had an amazing relationship. They figured out how they could work out their own issues and their own deals um, to take into account, look, my constituency needs this okay, my constituency needs this. How can we work that out so that I give you something, as General always said, something you can live with, not, not your maximum position, but can you live with this? And I don't think that we would be in this position if we hadn't had that unbelievable dedication. Um, and once the two of them came together, really we took a much more back backseat position and um, the parties themselves really drove the process from that point forward. Um, two quick things, though. Um, one, I would say, in terms of UNMIS, um, just to add on to what Fink has said, there are two additional bits. UNMIS operates under the Security Council mandate, uh, under the Security Council resolution, which established the, the peacekeeping mission. So 
you know, it has all these different uh, functions that are included in the mandate. Um, and then maybe, I think you want to add a little bit about uh, former President Thabo Mbeki, who is also leading up uh, sort of this implementation panel, um, which uh, is, is helping the parties. And then just on sanctions, um, uh, th I mean, this is an issue. It's, it's, we can have the debate about whether sanctions are effective anywhere, um, but this is something that uh, our, my government has put in place, and they have been in place for some time. We know that it, uh, it troubles uh, the Sudanese and, and others, um, but uh, uh, I, I don't think that that's going to change anytime soon, but I'll let, uh, I'll let the Special Envoy's office and, and the second panel address that. Thanks. Julian. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I'll probably come back to the issue of personalities. When, when you're being trained as a mediator, you're always told you've got to make abstract or abstraction or you've got to ignore the personalities. And you must never build your agreement or any form of negotiation around personalities. But the truth is, you've got no choice. You, you might want to build up a process in which you'll say personality shouldn't be that important or eventually if personality should disappear, they can easily be replaced by someone else. But the truth is that you can look at any process that has taken place in the last 20 years, and the figures and personalities come about. Now, some personalities change during the process. Some personalities might disappear during the process. But the truth is you find yourself always confronted with the issue of personalities and how you're going to deal with them. Now, you can have personalities who can be excellent leaders, or guerrilla leaders if you prefer, or fighters, or run organizations in combat. And when it comes to mediation, they're not that great. You can also have other commanders that are excellent fighters and to a certain extent might be good mediators too and know how to negotiate. But it doesn't mean they're excellent at the implementation at the end of the day. And so what you find yourself quite often with is personalities at certain moments according to the phases you're going through that have their importance. But it's rare that a personality you can say from A to Z has been the common person that has carried things forward. But that's worth what it's worth. Let us uh, take a quick round of a uh, quick second round. We'll take maybe two or three maximum, and we'll keep them short. Um, yes, the gentleman here. My name is Zaymad. I'm from Sudan Embassy. My question for Susan Beach. Uh, how can you describe the role of the United States in uh, positively or negatively in supporting the uh, SPLA, uh, military supporting the SPLA and the, so and the South and training and, uh, and uh, while, uh, while imposing sanctions uh, against the Northern uh, Sudan. Okay, and uh, Mike Phelan from the Senate uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. Good morning, Mike Phelan, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, my question goes to the three of you as experienced negotiators. If you could inform us from your experience to what degree this brinksmanship is the final necessary element to move to conclusive uh, decisions by the parties. In this case, we're looking at 100 days and there are others counting it down day by day. And yet, we still, as you just mentioned, have not concluded some of the essential decisions on the way to the referenda. Uh, have the parties, in follow-up to that, have the parties already decided what their path is going to be regardless? Thanks. Okay, we've heard from you. Let's just see if... Okay, we'll come back to you. <laughs> Abdul Karim Usman from the Royal Military College of Canada. Uh, given the um, volatile situations that everybody is describing, how much control does Juba has over SPLA forces? And what is their view of Khartoum ability to control their own, given what we hear about uh, the uh, disasters that would happen after the referendum? My question might be addressed to the general. Thanks. <laughs> 
Let me just deal with the one question, which is uh, uh, the question of the brinkmanship and what are we going to do with issues which haven't been resolved yet. Uh, I think it's absolutely inevitable that n uh, these issues are not going to be properly resolved by the time of the referendum. Uh, but the South has made it clear that uh, they have insisted and are insisting that the elections be held on time. And they have and have stated a deep fear that if they allow any shift in the date, it will be the beginning of a process of uh, uh, opening up the CPA. And so from their perspective, they'd rather say, let's have the referendum and then continue with the uh, resolving the rest of the issues which have to be decided. Sorry, I was asked a question about UNMIS in the post-referendum period. Uh, I would like to say uh, just two things. Firstly, uh, I think it's inevitable that the United Nations are not just UNMIS. I think the uh, entire system, including the development arms, are going to necessarily be involved uh, in, in the South. And I say that regardless of which the way in which the South votes. Uh, I think the South really does need capacity building and needs uh, all the assistance. But having said that, I think the Northerners have expressed the view that they also need some assistance and that there shouldn't just be a process of concentrating on the South and just abandoning the North. Uh, there are real issues. And just notice that today we haven't mentioned the D word at all. Uh, we've conducted this entire conversation without referring to Darfur. Uh, that might be one of the issues when I talk, spoke about gaps that were deliberately left out of the agreement. Uh, the mention of the D word was certainly <coughs> one, of, one of those. Okay, um, just to follow up uh, a little bit on um, Fink's mention of Darfur, um, one thing in terms of you know, maybe partly brinksmanship, but I, I would just say that we were specifically asked not to deal with Darfur in the CPA, which obviously makes it not a comprehensive peace agreement. And as has been mentioned um, in numerous um, uh, think tank pieces, you know, peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, in pieces, P-I-E-C-E-S. Um, so, you know, I think this is just a reality. I mean, we have the Eastern Sudan peace agreement. We have the Darfur, you know, what one thinks about the Darfur peace agreement. We have the CPA. So, um, you know, we are constrained by what we're allowed to do as mediators or supporters of, of a process. Um, I agree also with Fink that I think at the end of the day, in terms of brinksmanship, I mean, there were a number of times during the CPA negotiations I mean, it's already been said that um, the timing was right, but it was ripe for resolution. And um, I think for a number of reasons that were really mentioned in Steve Morrison's over uh, sort of um, setting the stage and then uh, Jennifer's introduction, um, where you had really a combination of events all occurring around the same time, Nonetheless, there were still moments when um, clashes flared up, even though we had a cessation of hostilities, or where events took place, and um, our colleagues here all remember suitcases just kind of going down the hallway, and uh, we were suddenly informed that one side or the other side was leaving. And um, so brinksmanship was, I think, always a part of the negotiations, and I, I think that you know, now that the issues are so serious and so real, it, it, they're going to be there again. Um, in terms of the um, U.S. government's support of the SPLA in terms of military training, uh, while at the same time having sanctions on the North, I think we have to be realistic about the times that we're living in in the United States. There have been a number of conferences talking about Sudan and, and what can be done. Um, it's vital, I think, that we have had the role of uh, the international uh, NGOs and, and whatnot um, keep people informed and on their toes. But at the same time, it has also constrained, I think, the space. Um, and as everyone knows, it's been very difficult to figure out where the U.S. should be coming down on, where um, the general already mentioned, the ICC indictment. You know, we end up spending a lot of our time on should – Bashir have been invited to Kenya? Should he have been invited to Chad? Should he have been received? We're not signatories to the Rome Statute. I mean, it's all of this is a little um, schizophrenic. So, um, but you know, at the same time, we've had a long role of uh, of engagement with the South, uh, and um, sanctions don't apply in them. So, I, you know, I, I I'm not trying to make an excuse, but. 
I think we have to deal with the reality that's in front of us. And I think a lot of people took uh, a tremendous um, hit, if you would say, in the uh, from the U.S. administration, both past and present, for wanting to actually deal with the government in the North and others saying we should never deal with this government because they've been accused of genocide. So it's, it has been a tough situation to navigate, and I think that has put successive special envoys in a very difficult position as well. I don't think it is the last word. Um, <laughs> Jeff, before I, 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 I answer your question, whether uh, SPLM, uh, whether the government of Southern Sudan is in charge of the SPLA or whether the North is in charge of SAF, I want to uh, say this, that uh, although these eminent persons are, be, are being referred to as drafters, they, they just are not really drafters. They are mediators in their own right. Part of, they represented, and I think they did more than just draft. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to tell you that, that they were able to engage the parties. They, they, negotiated, with the, they, they negotiated with the parties as, as mediators. And, and therefore, um, I think you should not go with the notion that these people are just people who drafted things with the parties. They had to get positions from the parties and mold them and help them. And I, they are not the only ones. Um, Charles Snyder here. Um, from the Troika side, we're, we're doing their own mediation too, in, in, in one way or another. And, and quite a number, the, the, the Norwegians, the, the, the Italians, of course, the Igat people themselves. So. Let's make no mistakes. I mean, we, we provided the leadership. And this, is, this, is, this was, um, we even made ourselves a secretariat, which we, we, we didn't, there, was, there wasn't uh, anything like that. But we did uh, make ourselves a secretariat that ran the process. So I want, these people are more, more than just drafters. They, are, they were more um, mediators too. As far as the issue of Remember, I don't, I don't live in Sudan. I live in Kenya. So I, if I tell you anything about control or no control, it's just from my perspective, uh, from perception. It's the way I see it. Yes, I think both sides are in control of their armies. But from what we've seen in the past in Africa, no political power or political system is totally in control of an army. And so the army can run amok, and there is nothing, there is no way you can stop it. The SPLA can run amok, and they can not, there is nothing the people in Juba can do. SAF can run amok, and there is nothing people in the north can do about it. It's just that the army has to be loyal to the authorities, but there is no way you can, you can control them. You can tell them, do this. Yes, they will do it, but what happens if you get people who believe? And I think on both sides, there are elements that could easily be loose cannons. Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, on that ominous note, um, <laughs> Let's bring this panel to a close. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I think resource uh, persons really doesn't do it when you talk about the folks here at this panel. Uh, thanks for your insights. We're going to move quickly to the next panel, so um, please remain in your seats and we'll, we'll, we'll move over. Thanks again. Thank you.